And we are live Wednesday, March 2nd, first Wednesday for Woke Women Wednesday and Women's History Month. And there's so much going on. I'm going to use today. We're going to do some catch up and um, some share with you some exciting news about what Woke Women Wednesday, WWOCradio.com is going to be doing this month to celebrate uh, Women's History Month. We have so many women of color. Uh, black and Latina women who have been very quietly during COVID. We've talked so much about COVID. We haven't talked a lot about what is going on. And we started last week with the um, uh, introduction of the interim president of Roxbury Community College, our own beloved Jackie Jenkins Scott. And all of the years we've been on, we uh, almost two years actually, I have never gotten so many uh, comments, commentary, about a guest is I've and I've had some incredible ones as you know we've had um, certainly no one's broken Congresswoman Presley's record for um, viewing, but the comments um, about uh, Dr. Jackie Jenkins Scott have been so incredible and so deserving, and I, I think she knows that there is so much excitement just a, just excitement about her being um, uh, uh, being at RCC for however long, but this is March. And I'll always start by saying the very reason we're here is because we had uh, three uh, dynamic sisters with a vision and just in, in just intuitively knowing that it was important for us um, in, in this time of COVID because I've been, it'll be two years in May already. I can't even believe it. Um, but uh, so that means 2020 is when we were introduced to Woke Women Wednesday. And um, these three women knew how important it was for us to have a medium to bring you information on a timely fashion about all things we say black, brown, and COVID. I've had the privilege and pleasure of doing it on every Wednesday uh, since May, uh, May of 2020 at 11 a.m. in the morning. And then of course, my fierce and fearless warrior, traveler, sister, um, uh, star, superstar, rock star, uh, city councilor, Julie Mejia, she closes at eight. But uh, we really want to talk. So I want to say thank you to those women. We're here every Wednesday, wwocradio.com, Facebook Live, and we're going to have a ball in the month of March. I do want to get caught up, though, in some of the things I'll end by talking to you just about some of the things that are going on in Boston. But I want to talk about the month of March because we are going to be showcasing some of the stars. Um, and I think some, some public, some quiet stars you know, of, of Boston, greater Boston, that keep this city running, that are behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, young and old, um, I say young and seasoned, let me put it that way, um, and it's going to be a blast. And we're also going to be featuring some of our women-owned businesses in the process. And so we will be uh, joining you on Wednesday evenings, right? So just so you know, we're going to be here on Wednesday evenings for the rest of the month on the 9th, on the 16th, on the 23rd, and on the 30th. And we're going to be coming to you from some pretty important places in our uh, greater city of Greater Boston. We're going to start on the 9th. Uh, we'll be here from 5.30 to 8. In fact, we'll be going live at 7, but from 5.30 to 8.30, we're going to be mixing it up at Norvia's, um, uh, Norvia Pena's Fort Hill Bar and Grill on Washington Street in Roxbury. On the 16th, we will be at uh, Saleo. And uh, you know the proprietor, Cheryl Strader in Nubian Square uh, on Washington Street also, but down in Nubian Square. And we will be uh, on the 30th, actually, I'm sorry, um, the 23rd, we'll be at the Residence Inn and the Marriott on um, uh, Melnia Cass Boulevard. Can't miss that. Melia Cass herself is a legend in, 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 uh, in Boston, I think even nationally, but she is Roxbury's, Roxbury's own, uh, enough to have a street, you know, named after her, but uh, we'll be at the Marriott. And then on the 30th, we're going to close out um, uh, with our sister, Ania Grace, at uh, Daryl's Bar and, 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 and Grill, Bar and Kitchen. So um, it's going to be a blast. Because not only are we going to be there, but in every place that we're going to be visiting in this month of March, 
um, we are on Wednesday evenings. I said, we're going to be kicking it up in their business. It's, it's spring. Actually, we're going to daylight savings time in the next two weeks. You know, the sun will be up until seven, almost seven thirty already. So, you know, we, we've been through it as we've been through it. And if you are one of those blessed, and I hope you know that it is a blessing, um, to be able to come out of this healthy, alive, well, with some semblance of our very own sanity, then you are blessed and you are blessed. And we ought to be, we're not ready. Don't, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Um, Bernadine, this is my new edition concert hairstyle. So I was up rolling my locks last night and almost didn't make it on this morning. So I thank you for the compliment. <laughs> I thank you. Thank you. Um, but, but, but know that, um, we got some women doing some incredible stuff, right? We got some women doing some incredible stuff and we're going to be ready. We're going to be ready. We're going to be ready. And so, um, I just want to give you a few names of people that we're inviting to pass through, uh, on our Wednesday evenings, right? Um, uh, uh one, I, I would say we have to certainly, we, like I said, we, we, we started, uh, we started already last week with Jackie Jenkins Scott and the exciting news about Roxbury. But you know what? She's not the only college president. Aisha Francis, you know, the president and CEO at Benjamin Franklin Institute. Um, Benjamin Franklin Institute, for those who don't know, was created by grant of the one Benjamin Franklin himself who left this in his will. And that money was used to actually start the, the institution hundreds of years ago. Right. So um, there's a sister in charge and in fact, in charge of what is a massive plan and process underway to move Benjamin Franklin Institute into Nubian Square from down um, in the back bay, the south end back bay. Um, so I'm hoping we get to see Aisha in the month of, of, uh, of March. And um, I'm going to just run some names. Makiba McCrary, we're going to be inviting. Um, Akiba is the president of the Commonwealth Fund, one of the uh, many um, of, 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 of things, incredible and positive and important things born out of the racial unrest and the racial reckoning that began during COVID. And so we hopefully we'll get to see her, our U.S. Attorney, Rachel Rollins, Tanya Anderson. You know, we're going to be in her home district in District 7, the first Muslim woman to serve as a, um, uh, to be elected and serve as in the Boston City Council. And by the way, um, by the way, um, I also would add next to Tanya Anderson's name, Councilor Anderson's name, the fact that she is the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means. For those of you who don't know, that's really, that's a long way to say the Money Committee and so in City Council. And so they are in budget process now doing hearings on budget. We're so proud of her. We hope to see her, Ruthie Lujan. Ruthie's the first Haitian American woman elected to the City Council. City Councilor, citywide city councilor. And so we're going to be um, looking for, 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 um, you, for Lucy. Not just, not just elected officials, though. Like I said, we got some folks doing some other stuff. Nicole Obi, who's the new president of BECMA, Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, organization that has literally kind of been um, uh, seized, stepped, stomped um, uh, 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 onto the map. Uh, of, of, of relevance and in every discussion around what's happening with black businesses. Um, Ashley Rose, some of you know Ashley because you know her to be um, uh, uh, immersed in Boston's art com artist community. So very important that we don't forget, especially in this time with folks dealing with so much of the, the, um, the reality of the, the, the pressing on our mental health, right? On our spirit. And never forget the importance of art in uh, Black culture and the Black narrative and the Black diaspora. And so uh, we want to see some, some, some young folk here too. Um, Dr. Priscilla Douglas, name not familiar to you, it should be, not only because she was a former, one of the first Black female secretariats to ever serve in a cabinet in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, also a White House fellow, but right now, the sister is the chairman of the board of the Boston Public Library, okay? Yeah, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. So we're hoping we get to see Priscilla during the month of, 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 of March passing through. 
um, Colette Phillips. You know, this sister has been on, on the ground and in the, in the fight for such a long time, but um, never has, has never stopped, never stopped her discussion and her impressing upon us the importance of diversity and inclusion. See, some people talk about diversity and that's what you just have the different people in the mix. Inclusion means something, a whole different thing. And you know that uh, Colette and her partner team uh, was the, represented the first time uh, a year ago a little over a year ago, first time um, uh, uh, any contract had ever been let with the city of Austin, a uh, $2 million contract to devise the beginning of a tourist pitch for the city as we thought then we were going to be moving right out of COVID and COVID wasn't, we might've been done with COVID, but COVID wasn't done with us. But the the uh, all, all inclusive to, uh, 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 um, pitch, and I think it's really tried to call it a pitch. I'm going to say that their whole production, the whole program, the whole the whole vision, the, some of the, the commercials just made you smile. And why? Because they took us into Boston, into the neighborhoods of Boston. And I actually was privileged to see a preview of phase two, of round two of the all-inclusive community uh, of Boston. And you think, if you think you enjoyed the first First phase, wait until you see what they have in store in this second phase. It's a, it's amazing. It's just amazing. It's amazing. Some people don't know that uh, Helena Adjaye, the, the executive vice president of the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau, another sister of color. You know, the name is a lot people won't know, but you're going to get to see these women and the faces during this month. Um, you, you've seen Dr. Uh, Basola Ojukutu who probably has the toughest, most challenging job in the city of Boston, probably as any health professional in the state of Massachusetts as the executive director of the Boston Public Health Commission because she, has preside, she is presiding over uh, a process to try to manage a whole lot of different personalities and opinions about what Boston should be doing. I can't imagine a more able an appropriate person who would be steering this effort than Dr. Basola Ojukutu. She's a young sister. She's a bad sister too, I'm telling you. Um, I've had her on in this past year, but we're hoping to see her um, in this next week. I'm just looking at some of my other names here because I want you all to know that it's not um, Danella Clark. Um, I don't know if you all saw, if you didn't need to Google, you know, the virtual tour of the new Boston Arts Academy our new public uh, arts high school, the building. It is like something out of a Star Trek movie. It is absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous. And why? Because they were wise enough to place at the helm of the responsibility, the foundation, the Boston Arts Academy Foundation and the person charged to raise the money for this incredibly beautiful edifice that we can now claim as our own in the city, they chose the queen. Uh, she's got to be the most savvy, um, savvy and effective fundraiser I've ever seen. And that is Danella Clark. Um, she's been a guest before, but I'm hoping she's going to pass through because guess what? The school is ready to be seen. And if you get a moment, like I said, Google it, do that virtual tour. You won't believe what you see. Um, those are just some of the names. Those are just some. In fact, if you guys have some ideas for others, um, please let us know. What we're going to do is we're going to be posted up. Um, Julia on one end of the, of the sofa or you know, the chairs, and I'm going to be on the other. And we're going to have people come and visit us as we work through our city and are talking to some of our um, the, the very names of these women. And so we want you to come. We want you to, like I said, um, uh, Fort Hill Bar and Grill on the ninth. Um, residents in on the sixth on the uh, on the I'm sorry, Fort Hill Bar and Grill on the ninth. Soleil on the sixteenth. Residents in on uh, Marriott residents in Melania Cass on the twenty third, and Daryl's Bar and Grill Bar and Kitchen on the thirtieth. And we're gonna have a good old kind of just reception, hang out, come eat, patronize these businesses. It's, it's nice to be able to see people. You know that the city in this past um, 
oh, I want to say Monday, I guess, Monday, or maybe yesterday, depending on when you watch this, uh, this week um, ha has lifted the mask requirements. They lifted the VAX requirements two weeks ago, but for restaurants and uh, lifted mask requirements. Now, believe me, I'll still be wearing mine. That's just my personal choice. You do what you need to do, but it'll be nice to be out to see people, right? We're going to see people. We are going to see folks, and I'm excited about that, and I hope you are too. Um, uh, certainly on the national level, we got a sister to talk about, one Katanji, right? Katanji Brown-Jackson. Um, I actually have my, you can't see it, my Souls to the Polls t-shirt on today because I'm doing this in honor of the nominee, um, Katanji. I actually have been shocked, people. We are going to have a Supreme Court justice named Katanji. Who could ever have imagined that? Just really. Like I, I, I posted on Facebook, I'm a dreamer, and I had prayed that this day would come Sunday, but I didn't, I didn't see it happening now. And um, it's, it's overdue, don't get me wrong, overdue, long overdue, but I didn't see it happening now. But here we are, we are about to have a Supreme Court justice named Katanji, right? Katanji, imagine that. Imagine that. It's not a Disney movie. This is real. We're about to have a Supreme, a Supreme Court justice, a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States of America named Katanji. And from everything that we've heard about her, there is few that we could imagine that are more qualified. That's got to be the kicker to the folks who are just upset, just want to figure out a reason, you know, to say this won't work, this can't work. She's probably one of the most qualified nominees they've ever had you know, ever had nominated to the court, period. I didn't say black, well, ever. Harvard undergrad, Harvard Law School, from Miami, right? From from Miami. And um, my excitement about it is that she will be the first public defender to ever sit on the court, right? She literally represented poor people on her kind of on her career on her way to the circuit court of appeals which is where she sits now she's been she's been uh, confirmed by the city by the uh, united states senate three times already so <laughs> you're gonna watch watch that watch those machinations uh, for them to try to figure out how all of a sudden now she is um uh, uh in, in, in uh, you know unqualified or 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 inappropriate for the court. So, I, you know, it might be a little bit of a hick, hiccup or hitch, but she's, she will be she will be confirmed. She will be confirmed and then we'll all celebrate. And then what we'll also be very mindful is that it's gonna take more than one voice, one new voice on that court to stop the bleeding and set things right, which is again, why I have my Soul to the Polls t-shirt on because yesterday in Texas, we began to see the first um, uh, uh, impact of what happens, of what is happening as a, a result of this full-on attack on access to voting. Not just voting rights, but access to voting and challenges to whether the, uh, the votes, even when cast, will, even, will ever will count. And um, we saw it in Texas, like wholesale. The irony is, though, from all the reports and what we've read, is that the um, the challenges that they faced in Texas were felt were visited upon both white and black Republicans and Democrats. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see some rollback of some what they did, but it's not going to happen soon, right? It's not going to happen soon, and that won't happen soon enough um, for the 2020 election. The other thing that happened and may have gone under the radar from a lot of people who didn't see it because I talked about her, I think briefly two weeks ago, because this woman has been on my mind, um, Pamela Moses, for those of you who don't know Pamela Moses, she's a um, Black Lives Matter activist in, um, ooh, I wanna say Tennessee. Um, she'd been doing national work too on voting rights. Uh, she actually attended um, part of the, of the, um, the, the rallies for Ahmad Arbery in Brunswick, Georgia, over the last several months during trial, 
during the trial, the course of the trial, and lead up to the trial, the first trial. She um, was uh, a, had a had a record, former felon, former felon, who um, in in the run up to the twenty one election um, uh, filed an application. Actually, sought approval to file an application to reinstate her right to vote. Um, you know, I think in Massachusetts, it's so often on so many levels that we forget or we get spoiled or we just have no idea of what is happening in other parts of the country because things are a little different here. In Massachusetts, you, um, you don't lose your right to vote um, uh, when, uh, when you're incarcerated. Uh, and, 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 and for those who, who, um, who, who are released from jail or prison, you, in Massachusetts, you can register, re-register, register immediately. So there's no loss of, you're not disenfranchised um, by uh, a run-in um, in serving time, you know, in, in the law. And so, um, there's more detail on that. And of course, maybe in another time in another show, I'll go into a little bit more detail. But the bottom line is because she knew that there was a process in, in Tennessee, she actually did fill out um, an application, um, went to the clerk's office, the registrar asked them, they told her yes and gave her a form. Um, and so not only she just filed it, but she actually sought permission. She got a letter. She went to her probation officer. How about that? And, and, and to check and got a letter from the probation officer. And, um, and in the end, she was arrested and prosecuted for filing the application. She never voted in 2021. Uh, she never voted in 2021. So let me just say this again. She never voted in 2021, uh, but she sought approval to be able to vote. And uh, before uh, the, anything happened, right? Like I said, she got two letters of approval. She was arrested by the prosecutor in her town or district or county and prosecuted, went to trial and, the, uh, and convicted of uh, voter rights fraud. She never voted, convicted. And one of the things that, uh, you know, she, like I said, her, her probation office, the election official, registrar, um, came and testified that they had, you know, and she produced the documentation that they had issued her a letter. Um, you know what the judge said? That she must have tricked them. Mind you, nothing, she withheld nothing. Everything I'm telling you, I'm telling you because I know from her application. So she didn't lie. She, she, she was convicted and sentenced to six years in prison for filing an application with permission of the voting of election registrar. So this week on Monday, uh, the, she uh, was the, the, the judge, appeals judge, approved. Um, uh, it's horrific. The thing has had me, given me sleepless nights since I read her story. She was convicted. And by the way, when she was arrested, which was before Christmas, I'm, I'm not sure if it was before Thanksgiving, but it was well before Christmas, she was in jail through the whole time until this past Monday. She was released, a judge, and a, a, a judge uh, uh, approved um, a new trial for her. So she is free for the moment, not, not vacated, just a new trial, right? Um, and so you have to forgive. I actually am one of those people who has a land phone. <laughs> so I have a land phone and you can hear it ringing in the background. Um, but she was released on Monday. And so I think of the stories that I read about the um, uh, 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 conservatives or Republicans in Arizona in Texas, and then the third state, I can't remember, who voted uh, for uh, dead relatives. One, one gentleman's wife had died. He voted in her name and voted in his name. And the two other gentlemen voted in their deceased mother's name, voted. 
None of those three got more than a weekend in jail. One of them got a weekend in jail. The other two got probation. This woman, and they actually voted, fought, actually actually voted on behalf, eventually it confessed to have voted on behalf of dead people. This woman, Pam Moses, never voted and got six years. So it's connected to me because it's why I get so excited about the fact that we're about to have a Supreme Court justice named Katanji Brown Jackson, because those things are absolutely connected, because these are the kinds of real life, everyday experiences that our folks are having right now, like every day right now. This happened this week. On Monday, she was released, okay? Um, so this is not something that you know, we can talk about in civil rights and long time ago. I'm talking about 72 hours ago this happened, uh, lest you think our work is done. Um, so, so just a lot to do and a lot to be thinking about. Um, and then Boston's had its own moments. Oh my goodness, in the last, just in the last two weeks, and you think about it, we've lost uh, the former state senator, Bill Owens. Um, right? Former state Senator Bill Owens. Um, uh, what is the, uh, uh, Walter, like I knew Walter Porter, who was a captain, one of the first and early black captains in the Boston Fire Department. Um, Billy Celester, who, who's, who's, whose tenure as a um, uh, uh, assistant, um, uh, what was it? Um, uh, I don't even know the titles. I'm going to say captain, sergeant, whatever, because I think he had almost all of the titles. But Billy Celester was legend and known for his toughness and his compassion as a black police officer in the city of Boston. We had to work with, we, I had a chance to work with him long before, um, you know, politics, but as a member of the NAACP involved with the city during the whole, you know, stop and frisk. And um, I would say that he, he led with his heart um, uh, all the passings, all of the passings, but none, I think, really hit the city um, like that of the news of the passing of the son of Dr. Lisa Owens and Daryl Settles. And so I just want to take my time and take the time. And I thank you all who have been placing in the message and sent me inbox to make, please make sure you mention, of course I would, um, Daryl Settles, uh, Dr. Lisa Owens and, and uh, your daughter Taylor, um, it is so, so, so hard um, to imagine what you must be going through. Um, and I've used the word unimaginable. I saw Dr. Um, Priscilla Douglas use that word as well, unimaginable. But um, there are no words that would appropriately communicate to, to you and your family the pain, the, the, the prayers, the love, um, and the hurt that we um, are, have for you at this moment? Are you prepared to bury your son on Friday? Um, if we could take some of it for you, we would. But just know that you know you have our blessings and our condolences, and most important, our prayers. Just just know that um, this is Boston. So much is happening, and so much loss. And um, you know, I, I say again, and maybe we'll have somebody come back. I think Dr. Gloria White Hammond was a guest almost a year ago when we thought we were kind of winding down COVID because I thought we needed to hear from someone talk about, you know, dealing with, you know, the, the spirituality and the, 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 the medical, um, the, the, the health reality of the kind of trauma that we've been experiencing. <clears throat> and we have, and we have. And so maybe it's time to come back because um, I can speak for me, never understood before this last two years, the relevance and the importance of the rituals of funerals in our community and our society, you know, not for black people, it's a special, but just, but just generally um, not being able to do that in the way that we are used to doing that has left an enormous sense of unfinished and unresolved um, uh, um, uh, mourning uh, for, for me, always there in the side of my head, uh, in the back of my head, 
And this last two weeks and all of what we have heard has only reminded me of um, the need for us to be talking about this, right? Um, because I also two weeks ago shared with you the passing of Lauren Sampson, who was one of the senior attorney uh, for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, who, who took her own life on the same Sunday as the woman, the former Miss America, um, uh, Miss USA, Chrisette, I can't think of her last name, but Chrisette in New York, um, the, on that same day, I think it was the 30th, um, the same day, um, uh, right here in Boston. And so um, it's real, the pain is real. Um, the need to resolve and the mourn and, and the hug and the inability to do what we normally do and the ritual, that's part of what we're losing, what we miss. And that is the hugging, the, the crying together, the touching, you know, we, the, to the extent we've not been able to do it, um, just seems to me like we don't have, we haven't had closure really. And so um, praying for you, Daryl Settles, praying for you, um, Lisa Owens, Dr. Lisa Owens, for real. Um, just no words, no words. Um, so that's it. I wanted to catch up with you. Um, uh, you know, I'm excited about the uh, woke uh, uh, WWOC uh, radio.com. I'm, I'm excited about the plan for Women's History Month. Bernadine, as a black woman business owner, I'm hoping to see you at one or two or all of those sessions because people need to have an opportunity to see the folks that we talk about. Um, Bernadine was one that came in, came into our space early because of her work and as a provider, uh, a merchant who um, uh, sells PP, PPE. And, and one of the highlights for me uh, in this last 22, 23, actually um, March 4th. So we're two days away from the two year anniversary of the declaration of emergency schools were shut down on the 4th uh, and, and which began this last two years for us, which has really been a blur, right? But it's real. Um, but one of the highlights of dealing in all of the COVID madness is being able to insist and drill down and force and advocate to make sure that if, with all of the conversation and the resources put to this, put to bear in Boston and in Massachusetts, all of the monies um, that have been put to bear for this dreadful virus that we made sure that there were black and Latino businesses that got some benefit. Because uh, as um, uh, Danella Clark, I think shared with me last week in the briefing they had for this new uh, equity panel on, uh, on COVID recovery, Massachusetts has received 142 billion, let me repeat B not an M, 142 <clears throat> billion dollars since the beginning of COVID, which is probably more money than we've received from the federal government in the pre previous 25 to 30 years. But in two years, we've received that, that level of monies for various kind of COVID related um, uh, uh, costs. And, and the big question, and one that I think we're going to be focusing much of the conversation in April, because in March, we're going to do Black Women History. But in April, we're going to get down to that conversation about where the hell is the money. Because there's no way in this earth, on God's green earth, that you could spend $142 million and we not be able to see it. So you know this is my favorite discussion, and that is following the money. So in April, our focus is going to be on where the heck is it and whatever is left where and how we make sure that our ben our people, our students, our, you know, benefit from it. So I'm going to, I'm signing off. Um, and just wishing you all well. Remember what I say every week, check on your people. And when I say check on your people, I mean FaceTiming, Zooming. The phone calls are not enough anymore because people can tell you anything over the phone. Say I'm good. You got to see them. Look in their eyes because the eyes are the window to the soul. You, you know that. I know that, right? And so, you know, don't worry. Don't rush. You know, when everybody's talking about we got to get, you know, no more masks, no more vaccinations and all, 
Mm -mm. They're not really talking to us because I can tell you all you got to do is go on cityofboston.gov, look at and, uh, .gov, COVID, look at the numbers. And yes, we have communities, we have neighborhoods that are in the high 80th percentile in terms of being fully vaxxed and, and, and getting their testing. But we also have neighborhoods like Mattapan uh, that are still in the 50th percentile which means that almost half of the adults in that community are still not vaccinated. Now, why is that even a big deal to us? Because that's where the folks live who are, I call them the first responders, the first line of defense. Those are the essential workers. Those are the people who are working in the grocery stores, riding the buses, driving the buses, you know, um, at the nursing homes, taking care of your mama, my mama, right? Um, uh, the orderlies at the hospitals, the, the kitchen staff, that's who they are. And so if you don't think that that's important to you, if you're the kind of person who thinks, because uh, when I'm good, we're all good, then this probably isn't even the right kind of show for you, because this is about the whole. This is about the whole, that none of us are safe until we're all safe. And so for Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, Hyde Park, and Roslindale, we are not ready to, to turn off the lights and go home. We still have work to do. And so Black Boston COVID-19 Coalition continues to do their work. They'll be at Council Towers, our senior development on tomorrow up in Eccleston Square. They'll be at the Immigrant Family Services Institute on Friday and next Wednesday and next Tuesday we'll be back on the Lower Blue Hill Avenue, 366 Blue Hill Avenue at the Mews um, from all from three to, 11, three to seven, three to seven. That means we get people in the daytime and those folks who leave work and want to bring their kids. So come, continue to wear your mask. This is just my plan. I can't tell you what to do, but just because the city tells you you don't have to doesn't mean you should take it off. You know, use your common sense. Stuff, Stuff's not ready around us. We're not ready. Other than that, stay safe, people. Enjoy. Stay safe. The weather's changing. Still be mindful. COVID ain't done with us, even though I'm sure you all and we all about done with COVID. COVID's not done with us. On behalf of WWOC Radio, wishing you the best. See you next week.